Hi, I'm David, and welcome to the Data Source Rex podcast, where we interview data visualization experts and get to know them and their data visitors that a little bit better. By the end, you should learn new skills and get inspired to enhance your own data viz game. And today's guest is Ken Flerlich, who is a Tableau Zen master and also brother of Kevin Flerlich, who we had on the podcast a while back. So welcome, Ken. Thanks, David. Good to, good to be here. <clears throat> yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for being on the podcast. And um, it's yeah, great having you here. If, uh, I've seen a lot of your work and we'll see that coming up soon. But it's, it's yeah, really inspiring to have you here. So hopefully we'll, we'll learn a lot and um, yeah, get inspired. So, OK, cool. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the format, um, for the first half of the podcast, we'll uh, be going through one of Ken's data visualizations, asking a few questions, what inspired him, how did he go about making it? And, and questions like that. Um, for those of you on the audio podcast, I will put a link to the viz in the show notes below, and I'll just uh, describe things a little bit clearer so you know what we're looking at. Uh, and in the second half, we're going to be looking, uh, or just asking Ken just some general questions about his experience uh, and his approach to how he does data visits. So all in all, it should be good fun. And uh, yeah, I guess let's, let's dive in. So I'm going to bring up the... Data viz. And today's data viz is, uh, it seems like a very personal topic to you, Ken. It's about the uh, rhino poaching. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, and it was actually, this was for an Iron Viz uh, competition hmm. two years ago. So it was the, the um, uh, boy, I forget the, the title of the competition, but it was basically about animals and, and plants. Um, and, you know, this was something where I just kind of, I knew there was a problem here and really wanted to help sort of bring attention to the problem. Um, interestingly enough, they just uh, had the same, a similar data set for a makeover Monday. So we saw a lot of really good uh, rhino poaching uh, visualizations that, you know, once again, helped to kind of bring some attention to this subject. Mm. No, that's, that's really interesting. I have to go check those out. And it, but I'm just really impressed with your one. It's really striking, like um, how creative you are. Rather than just putting a couple of numbers up on the page, you've really, like, I've looked at this in advance, and there's, there's such a great story, and there's loads of little hidden uh, tidbits in here. Every, even, the, even the sort of blood dripping down is like a reverse bar chart, which is, right, yeah. is, is kind of quite morbid, but also very apt for, for the topic, because it's, it's a horrible thing happening to these rhinos so I, I love you don't shy away from this stuff like the, the actual right and that was that was the intent um you know i coming into that iron viz i think i i hadn't been using tableau for probably less than a year at this point and mm. um and i would was an avid follower of of a lot of people's work and you know one per person in particular who did just and continues to do amazing stuff was Jeff, johnny walker um, and he, you know, kind of tends to do things on animals. Um, and so, you know, that was a big inspiration for me is, you know, I kind of wanted to do a Johnny Walker style uh, visualization, which I hadn't really done before. Mm. Um, but to your point, you know, it's such a, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not a light topic, right? And, you know, I, and I kind of made a, um, a conscious decision right up front that I wasn't going to shy away from the brutality of what's happening. I mean, mm. you know, what poachers are doing to these animals is, is very brutal. So I wanted it to be sort of in your face. I didn't want to shy away from, you know, some graphic images and things like that. And that bar chart was, you know, I actually probably spent more time on that bar chart than I did the entire rest of the, of the viz itself. Um, and I was inspired by, um, uh, a chart called uh, Iraq's Iraq's Bloody Toll. Oh, I've um, seen that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That shows it's a it's sort of an upside down bar chart that that looks like blood, and it's showing um, you know the deaths, the, the death toll in Iraq over over a number of years. Mm. So that was kind of what gave me the idea for that, and I thought, you know, well, what if I take that one step further and and actually make that bar chart look like real drops of blood um, and kind of put it up in the right hand corner like I did. And then and ultimately, you know, it worked out pretty well and it kind of is in your face and catches your attention, which was ultimately uh, you know, what the goal was. Totally. And it's like, even if people didn't interact with it, it's still 
very striking from a visual point of view, but it tells a hidden story too, um, which is, yeah, very clever. And you know, when you hobby a mouse over, you get to see the, how many rhinos the poachers killed, um, right. which, which is, yeah, really interesting. And it's kind of declining, but I'm, am I, am I, should I be optimistic? Is that because things are getting better or is that just because there's less rhinos to kill? Yeah, I, that's a good question. And, and um, you know, I, and I think part of the problem is the data that I had in there right now only t- goes up to, I think, 2016. So it would be interesting to c- revisit that, you know, mm. two years later and see what the impact is. I mean, but but speaking of that, I mean, if you go down a little bit further, oh, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. somewhere, um, if you go down a little bit further into the, there's a timeline section. I mean, there at least is some, you know, if you look at the... the is this the, the horn seizures? Of the black rhino, I mean, that has significantly dropped in the last hundred years. Oh, but yeah. At least one little bit of, of positive news in this, and, and that is the white rhino. Um, mm. White rhino in early 1900s, there was something, something like less than 50 of them known in the entire world. And over the last hundred years, um, you know, I, I would assume due largely to, to conservation efforts um, that that population has been brought up to over 20,000. So, um, and I think today it remains around that 20, 21,000 mark. Um, wow. So at least there's some positive news and some, you know, uh, some maybe some reason, reason to be a little bit hopeful that, you know, that mm. the efforts of, you know, of various con- conservation groups are, are making a difference in, in, you know, in the rhino populations. Yeah, totally. And it's, but it's just so chilling to look at the black rhino population. They added using the size of the animal, uh, I guess, uh, object to like demonstrate that. And yeah, a hundred years right. ago, 850,000 are now less than 5,000. That's shocking. And right. that's, yeah. the, con- the yeah. contrast just in the size of the icon too is the perfect way of doing that, I think, I feel. Because you actually see what's declining. You know, it's not just an abstract bar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very smart. Um, just for those of you who are um, heard a few seconds of music too, I, I just happened to see a um, uh, the uh, video autoplayed. So you've actually managed to embed a a YouTube video, which is really cool. I, I remember dabbling in this a while back, but uh, I never got it to autoplay. And I see you've kind of um, done use some shapes to not make it just a big black box. Right, um, yeah. Which is really yeah. fascinating. So um, this, I, I haven't actually seen the video, so I'll, I'll watch it afterwards. But is this um, the best, is this uh, highlighting the issue even further or is it showing ways we could help? Yeah, a little bit of everything. I mean, what, mm. what I wanted to do was, um, I, I, I'm, I was the same. I hadn't really done much with the video. And, um, you know, again, I had seen Johnny um, and some other folks like Pooja and Adam mm. who had, done some really good things with video. Um, and I wanted to do something like that as sort of just that just sort of gave an introduction to the problem. Um, so this was like a pretty good five or six minute video um, from an organization or, or about uh, it's called Tipping Point. Um, I forget mm-hmm. the organization that created it, but just gave sort of a good introduction of what's going on. You know, so it, it allowed it allowed it kind of provide that introdu- introduction without me having to write it all out in text. Um, so yep. it saved me text, allowed me to introduce the topic and then kind of get on to telling a more detailed story about specific things with data. Um, and to your point, I didn't oh. want just a big rectangle. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted um, to have, uh, you know, something that just sort of fit in a little bit better. And I had seen, uh, again, I'd seen Johnny do this with basically some images on the sides that just kind of, kind of give it a, uh, a rounded look and um mm-hmm. i thought that was just a you know a nice little uh thing to do to it to make it look a little bit a little bit nicer and, and build into the dashboard a little bit better yeah that's really smart is that using one of the newer tableau features like transparent um no i guess not dashboards but like is it just a, a png You're yeah it's it just a png with okay. um that it's kind of it's the corner and then it's got some transparency so if you right. if you go up to that right hand corner and try to click on the screen, it won't actually work because there's uh, a amount of it. Um, I see. Yeah. So cool. That's very smart. I like that. It's um, yeah. This is a good choice of using a video and just again demonstrates how flexible Tableau is. So it's it's 
really yeah fits really well um, and the auto play i mean um I, I, oh yeah sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't i think it's dependent on the browser now chrome has since um made it so that videos don't necessarily auto play i think um people were getting annoyed with all the ads that would automatically uh, play yeah, yeah. website so on my browser i've got chrome open and it's not auto playing um but uh, on other browsers i know it does I um, mean, that was a trick I learned from um, Adam Crayon. He um, he did something. It was one of the visit, Viz for Social Good projects. And um, and he didn't actually have a video, but he had background music. So as soon as ah. you open the Viz, yeah. it played this music um, that was just perfect, um, just really perfect sort of, sort of setting the tone of the, um, of the, of the Viz. And, and, you know, and it was, mm. and I just was, I remember seeing that and thinking, Oh my God, that is so amazing. Yeah. Um, and reaching out to him and asking what he, what he did. And basically he just used a, a YouTube video, um, hit it, you know, so that it wasn't visible on screen and set, mm. set the meg code so that it would autoplay and, uh, and just created this really beautiful effect. Of it. so that's very smart. I'm actually getting flashbacks to when I was, uh, had your brother on the podcast, uh, cause he, we, we had a quick look at his super Mario viz and I uh, mm-hmm. kept accidentally autoplaying the super Mario music oh, <laughs> right, right. and, um, which was again, a great use, like as he chose each different version of the game it would play the appropriate music but again yeah very clever use i'm gonna to have to look into that too because i feel um if used correctly yeah music could be a good addition to any any fizz yeah right yeah and i Perfect. did i did something like that um you know as soon as i learned that trick from adam i i had built this pac-man uh viz which basically just looked like or sorry it was miss pac-man it just basically looked like the video game with mm. the dots and the dots um indicated uh, high scores that were tracked on some um, some high score tracking website. Um, and I played the Miss Pac-Man music in the background. And it just, it, it does have a really nice effect when it's used appropriately and not overdone. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's, it's got, especially, oh yeah, I've, I've seen it here. I'll have to check that out later. I don't want to yeah. de- deafen my viewers again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's great. So yeah, we've got a really good idea of the inspiration for the Viz. Um, and it's, yeah, really inspiring. I've learned so much looking at this and we'll see more insights as we go through. Um, but before we move on, there's a lot of data sources. And I wanted to ask, how did you go about collecting the data and like choosing which data points to put in? Yeah, so um, that can often be a struggle for something like this is actually trying to find the data that you want. I mean, I knew I wanted... Uh, a handful of things. I wanted to know the number of rhinos that had been that had been um, killed, uh, you know, mm. due to over a period of time. Um, I wanted to know. Um, I wanted some statistics on uh, later on in the visit. There are some statistics around um, horn uh, horn seizures, um, and then uh, and then and then of course there's the sort of population data, and those were the sort of three key things I knew I wanted to spotlight in this. Um, and then it was a matter of finding that data and, and data like this can often be, like, as I said before, can often be very difficult to find. I was lucky though, um, you know, after doing some, some Google searches, I found websites that had this data pretty readily available. Um, you know, there's a whole website that just tracks uh, rhino poaching and poaching of other animals. So they had some good data and statistics for that. Um, and, and it was, you know, the data was pretty clean, so it was really easy to work with. I mean, ultimately, if you look at this, there's not a ton, there really isn't a ton of data. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, it's pretty simple, straightforward data. Um, and, but anyway, yeah, I mean, it wasn't particularly difficult to find and I didn't have to do a lot of cleaning. So it made my, um, life a lot easier. I mean, certainly, um, you know, in other projects, it's a lot more work and you have to, you know, you have to do a lot of that cleaning work. And, you know, I, I, I will use Tableau prep to do a lot of that sometimes, but, um, in this, well, Tableau prep wasn't even out at this, at the time that I built it, no, no. but yeah, it was, it was clean data and it, it just really made it easier for me to, to kind of focus on the design and the story. Amazing. And I, I think you, you mentioned a good point because more data doesn't always mean better data. So I love that you've only, You've only got like a, f- or a few data points here, or like you've only chosen a few insights from each one. Like you haven't tried to represent 
every single thing or every insight you've kind of stuck to the key ones which ultimately add to the narrative and story you have so it's it's really powerful the ones you picked out like um the declines the seizures of the horns but is that that's by customs is, is that correct or right correct agencies yeah, yeah. yeah so it's kind of it's it's kind of i feel conflicted it's great it's going up because it means like catching more illegal activity but it also means there's a lot of activity happening but it's exactly yeah yeah Yeah. um but yeah so i just like yeah you've really thought about what you want to put on the screen to tell this very succinct but nicely flowing story and i um it's it's tough i I often find it's harder to not put things on the screen than put stuff on the screen if that makes sense (laughs) so and this is a good example of that yeah yeah no, cool. Perfect. Thank you. And I also love, um, this seems to be a common theme of all the other Tableau's Air Masters I've been interviewing so far. And um, you've used a hover text icon to list out your data sources at the bottom, which I think is a great idea. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I do that a lot. I mean, it's, it's you know, especially when you have a lot of data sources, um, you know, it's, it's, if, if I have one or two data sources, a lot of times I'll just put that in the, in the footer. Mm-hmm. Um, this required a little bit more explanation. I mean, I wanted to have wanted to have a little bit of detail about what the visualization is showing, and then kind of show the the different sources and and add some notes there, um, just so people have a little bit more information. I also have another icon for the images, um, and and oh, you yeah. know I can get to that here in a moment. But mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure to clearly indicate where these images came from um, and, and give give credit to the. Uh, original photographers and, and sites that that had those well i guess whilst we're talking about it might as well you know, flow, keep it flowing like naturally <laughs> i noticed you have you have embedded a um a gallery inside a tableau viz and i don't think i've yes. seen this before and it's a great technical chat feat or like at least from what i can see but also it's uh, for want of a better term, the, the images are quite graphic um but i feel yeah. again goes back to the point i was thought you were making earlier you're not shying away from this it's right. disgust it's disgusting and it's kind of when i first saw it i was like oh but then i was actually very right. impressed that you're not shying away from this stuff because those yeah. horns have got to come from somewhere and it's exactly yeah. exactly yeah. and that, you know it, it, it wasn't like i went out and, and and actively sought out graphic images i just looked for images mm. that that were um, truthful, you know, that we're actually showing what's happening. And, um, and you're right. Some of them are very graphic and hard to look at. And yet, mm-hmm. you know, as I said before, I, I didn't want to shy away from that. You know, it, This is what's happening. And I wanted to clearly show that. Yeah. Um, back to the, the, the technique used here. Um, mm. So common theme uh, of this is, is, is uh, Johnny, uh, Pooja and Adam, I, again, and this is another thing I learned from them. Um, they, I had seen them use these sort of in, image carousels, I'll call them um, within their, um, within some of their visualizations. And it was just mm-hmm. a, a great way to show off a handful of images in this sort of interactive way. Um, so I wanted to do that with this and reached out to Johnny um, and, and just asked him how he did that. So he referred me to this tool called, um, oh, it was called uh, Syn- Syncopa. Um, and it's just a, just sort of an image, uh, a web-based image tool. Um, you upload your images, you select a certain type of way to lay those out. And then they, they provide you with the embed code. So it can be embedded in a website or really anything that where things can be embedded. So this is just a, a web object, a web page mm-hmm. object in, in uh, Tableau that is linking over embedded to embedded content um, and just creates this really nice, um, you know, interactive way of, of flipping through a handful of photos um, about the, some of these, uh, about what's going on um, and just give you a, a broader picture through images. Yeah, no, it's smart. And also it facilitates interaction. So if you want to, I'm just doing it now. If I click on one, it expands out. I can see it in more detail. And it's, yeah, it's not just sort of a gimmicky thing. It's it's actually going, hey, if you want to, hey, go look at it in more, in its okay. kind of gory detail, which is, I think it's a, it's a great idea because it, it's, you don't want to like shove it in people's faces, but it's subtle enough, like rotating around. But then if people, it does encourage people to, to then, look at it in more detail so it's that's a really clever idea um 
yeah, that's, this is, yeah, very good. Um, well, I'll make a note on one of these photos. So one of them is a photo of uh, Sudan, mm -hmm. uh, who, who was the last known male white rhino. At the time I built this, he was the last known northern white rhino male. Um, so northern uh, white rhinos are broke up into two different sort of subspecies, mm -hmm. northern white rhinos and southern white rhinos. And at the time, he was the last male white northern white rhino. So that was pretty important because he was the last one um, who could uh, you know, produce offspring. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was six months ago, a few months ago, he, he just died. So the last of uh, the last northern white rhino male. Um, has passed away so it, it you know it it's uh, probably time that that subspecies is probably over time going to um, you know sort of cease to exist unless they can find ways to breed it with uh other species or something like that oh that's terrible and i've got him up on screen now he he's not looking too happy for, i guess being the last one around it's not great but that's that's yeah, tragic you can see that it, i believe they actually removed his horn just and, and that's something that they'll do, uh, that the, they're doing more of is removing these rhinos horns so that they, so that uh, poachers do not try to attack them for the horns. So, oh. that, you know, the, um, you know, it, it protects the animal from poachers by doing yeah. that. That's interesting. I guess it is, if the, if it's going to get removed, it's better in a humane way, but it's right. still yeah. sad that has to happen though. It's, but yeah, I can right. see why yeah. they've done it. Wow. Interesting. I'm learning even more now exploring this. Thank you. This is, yeah, a powerful viz. Um, okay, cool. So moving on to the next question. Um, we've already spoken a little bit about it, but um, how do you go about, how did you approach the creation of this viz? Did you like dive into the data points and um, see what insights there were, or did you already have a rough idea? And like, yeah. what was your process for approaching this? Yeah. Um yeah, so I, I think I'm maybe a little unusual. I, I, I hardly ever have a picture of what I want to build, or in a lot of times, I, I don't even know what data I want. Um, you know, sometimes I just have a basic concept, and I knew a couple things going in. I knew I wanted that sort of Johnny Walker animal visualization style. Um, I knew it was probably going to be long form because I wanted some text to some explanatory text and, and kind of wanted to build it out in that fashion. Mm. Um, and that's kind of all I knew coming into it. Um, you know, so, um, it, you know, the first, the very first idea I had was that, that bloody bar chart. Um, and, and so I, I spent a whole bunch of time building that. And then over time, just sort of added pieces to it and rearranged things. I mean, um, I think, you know, there are three or four different sections and I think they were probably all in completely different orders at, at some <laughs> point. Um, and then, you know, as it all came together, I started rearranging things to sort of better tell the story in this sort of phased way. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I probably, I'm not sure how, how tall this thing is, but I probably resized it in Tableau 50 times, you know, because it kept running out of space and mm -hmm. adding space and then resizing it and adding more space. Um, wow. you know, so I, I don't ever really hardly ever come into it with this, this totally complete vision of what I want. I don't draw it out. I just sit down in Tableau, pull in the data, start exploring it, seeing what insights I can find, and then start building something and, um, and going from there. And that's, yeah. this was no exception to that. No, that's, that's cool. And I, I found, um, with all the other podcasts, there's no right or wrong way of doing this stuff. It's all whatever feels natural. So if you're comfortable with Tableau and you can kind of play around, explore, and then start building stuff this yeah that's a perfectly valid approach and i i, I find myself doing that quite a bit too because you don't know what you don't know right so you kind of kind of like build stuff and then see what sticks what looks good uh, and i think what, that's yeah. what's, what's great about tableau versus maybe some other um other mm -hmm. tools or you know coding libraries i mean i think if you're if you're building something that you have to write code to build Right, you have to go into that probably with a much better plan of of how you're going to lay this out, yeah. and what you're trying to build. So there's, you know, that planning stage I think probably takes up a lot more of your time, and, yeah. and probably you're using other tools to wireframe it or something like that. And to me, that's 
uh, probably one of the greatest things about Tableau is you can connect that data and then just start exploring it. And you can create a chart and you can, and you know, in, in seconds you can create sort of mm. these basic charts to, to figure out, okay, this, I think this will work or this chart will work. And, oh, this yeah. is something, you know, this chart gives me this, this, this really interesting insight. This is something I want to use. And then you can then take that and, you know, add the design and, and, and add those extra bits and pieces to really make it, um, you know, something that is that, that people want to look at and spend time with. Oh yeah, no, totally. It's, it's, yeah, that's one of the reasons I like it. You just, yeah, be creative. It's free form. Yeah. You just play around. You make, you make 10 visits, nine are bad. You only wasted two minutes. Like it's, whereas right, a lot yeah. of programs. Yeah. Okay. So next question. Um, I guess we've already got quite a few great insights which you've been sharing as we've been looking through this viz um but if you had to pick the number one insight from this viz what what would it be and please share it with us yeah yeah um you know certainly i think it's you know what you would expect and, and that is that these numbers are going up you know and and there are obviously re reasons for us to be concerned that that this isn't getting better um, but at the same time, as I mentioned before, there are these these small little uh, pieces of of hopeful information in there, um, such as the white rhino population coming back from you know near extinction in the early 1900s to um, you know uh, 20,000 or so. And, you know, it's not it's not a huge number, um, but it's mm. it's it's significant growth. So I, I think to me, I look at this, and even though it's um, you know, it's a very sad story that's being told. I, I think it, there is something positive that we can see in this, that there is an opportunity that if we continue, you know, to support these organizations that are doing work to, to, to fix this problem, that um, it is a fix, it is potentially a fixable problem. And, and I think that, you know, is more than just um, rhino populations it's it's you know it's everything you know it's it's other uh, populations of animals that are near extinction it's global warming it's it's all these these types of things that i think you know they can be solved if we um you know put our heads together and work hard um to to work to fix those so i think there is an element of hope that that hopefully comes out of of, of this yeah, that's that's perfect and that's actually made me realize there's quite a common theme with a lot of the guests I've been having on this podcast is a lot of the, they're using their data visualization skills for good. Like we've had Kasia talking about uh, plastic pollution in the oceans. And we had uh, Kevin talking about uh, drunk driving. And we've had uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, female superhero representation with some other visits, but they've all been really good. Mm -hmm. So it's not just using data visualization for like corporate greed, you know, it's actually, right. we're trying to use it to better society too, which is really inspiring to see. And and I, think, and I think one of the challenges that we have in our, you know, is I think we often, as Tableau people, we often are kind of stuck in our bubble of Tableau. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the challenges we have is how to get, how to get this information outside of that bubble um, mm. and share it with, with broader, broader audiences. And I think, um, you know, I think that's what, what I love so much about uh, the Viz for Social Good project that Chloe mm. has, that she's working with these organization, organizations and, and spotlighting, um, you know, things that are going on with, with, you know, dozens of, of vis community visits that people create and mm. that, to get that message out a little bit broader um and then of course things like what the tableau foundation has done with is it continues continues sorry continues to do with uh nonprofits. um i was privileged last year to have an opportunity to work with um the community community solutions who they just gave a big uh grant to um and they're doing great work to to help to uh reduce and and hopefully end homelessness um in oh, the wow. u.s so um i think there are lots of th lots of groups and organizations and projects that are that are trying to to use data visualization to um you know to to have an impact on on a positive impact on the world and more yeah. than than as you said and more than just trying to make money right yeah or, yeah or no, that's that's perfect, and I'll put I'll put a few links to those uh, 
like uh, the Fears for Social Good and the Tableau Foundation, the links below, if anyone else is interested um, to add, add, add their skills towards, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. I think that's just in general what's great about this community. It's, you know, it, they're just very generous with their time and skills, not with, just with mm-hmm. each other, but with people in need who can't afford those kind of skills too. So, yeah, right. really good stuff. Um, okay, so with this one, uh, I... I was wondering what skills you may have learned or honed whilst making this fizz. Yeah. So, um, and I was thinking about that a little bit and, and, you know, there are certainly some little tricks and, and techniques that I learned, you know, um, how to do the, you know, the embed the video and do sort of the curved edges and mm. the, uh, you know, the embedded, uh, image carousel, um, you know, those, those are definitely new techniques that I learned, um, in this process and, um, have used since then. Um, uh, I think this was actually my first sort of real long, long form kind of visualization or one of my first. So that was a real challenge for me, um, kind of learning that and figuring out how that, how to make that work and how, hmm. how to flow in a way, uh, in a certain way. So that, that was something I definitely picked up as well. Um, but something I, you know, I say about iron viz in general, um, you know, so this was, as I said earlier, this was less than a year after I started Tableau. Um, this was the, the third, no, the second, um, iron viz comp- feeder of that year. Um, and I had done the first one as well. And, and what I really found was that just competing in iron, these iron viz competitions. I don't know what it is exactly about them. It just really help you to up your game. I mean, you know, so when I, um, this was the second, uh, feeder of 2017 and I'd done the first feeder as well. And I just found that just, just building the visits for those competitions. Um, my skills just hit, took this huge jump, um, from where they were before. Um, and I don't know if it's just the nature of sort of something that's competitive or, or that it's something that, you know, I'm willing to put more time and effort into maybe than some of my other personal projects. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just amazing you know, the, the jump I took, um, in competing in these, these couple of feeders that year, um, from where I was before. And so I, you know, I'm, I've always been big on, 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 um, encouraging people at all levels to jump in these competitions. You know, it's not about winning. It's about, you know, getting this opportunity to do something good and interesting. And also really it's such a great opportunity to, to boost your skill set in a way that you just can't, at least I personally had had never been able to do without something like this this competition. Yeah, totally. It's like a lightning rod or like a a focal point to like hone your skills. And at the risk of sounding cheesy, I think anyone who enters, everyone's a winner because, like you just said, you benefit <laughs> learning your skills. It's kind of yeah, it's really corny, but it's it, it's true though. It's like it's, you shouldn't feel like you've lost if you don't win. It's you've still built this amazing, well thought out fears, which you can apply those skills back to your job or again charity work and that kind of stuff so it's yeah no i like that that's a a good skill to learn it's not all just about the technical stuff of tableau it's also about how you approach things and yeah that was perfect cool um okay so you actually have quite a few projects and we'll we'll, i'll scroll through those on the screen which which is great um i find it really inspiring uh but what's the next project or next big project you're working on you'd like to share with us you know, I, I've always got multiple things going at any given time. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I like to stay active and, you know, so I'm, I post the blog every two, at least probably usually every two weeks or so. And, and then I'm always, um, uh, tinkering with things and, and, and things like that. So uh, the, the thing, the, the newest thing, and it's not a huge one, but the newest mm-hmm. thing I'm working on is, is, um, options for different, um, uh, Tableau legends. So I saw a conversation on Twitter just recently where, uh, people were, were, you know, talking about some of the limitations of default, um, legends within mm-hmm. Tableau. And there are some limitations. And I think, um, a lot of us that are, you know, really active in the community know that there are different ways that we can do the, do legends that we can create legends. Um, you know, that, that aren't the default legends. Um, and, and I realized after reading through that, that Twitter conversation that there's probably a lot of people that, that aren't active, that don't understand, 
um, that there are all these other different ways that you can create your legend. So mm. um, that's the latest thing I'm working on is, is I think I'll have about eight different alternatives for creating uh, legends. I just posted the workbook on, on Tableau public and I'm working on a blog and hopefully we'll have that out here in a, a couple of weeks. Um, just, you know, intended for a broader audience of, of Tableau users mm. who, who, maybe aren't as crazy about this as we are and yeah and, uh, might might gain some some new new skills out of that oh that's exciting i'm gonna keep an eye out for that post um i actually just went to your website too and um i've just found the eyeball eyeball viz you made <laughs> <laughs> i think i said to you offline it, it's gross but i love it it's like so <laughs> smart um but these are just uh, for those of you who can see uh on the on the youtube podcast it's it's an amazing bit of achievement where you've managed to use action uh is it action filters or no action parameter actions yeah that's it yeah i'll I'll give you a little bit of background so i had this idea um about a year ago that i wanted to draw a sphere and i thought how can you draw a sphere it's a 3d object on a Mm. on a plane and I had done some things with um I built some 3D things um you know based on the work of of, of Bora uh Buran I'm not sure how you say his last name and, and mm-hmm. Anya Ahern um had had written a really nice blog post on on 3D and you know so I played I tinkered with that but I had this idea of how could I build a, a sphere and ultimately what I was trying to build do is 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 create like a model of Saturn. Uh, okay. Was partially successful, but um, uh, so but I had the idea that if I could draw a bunch of spheres, and then I could just sort of stack stack them on top of each other, um, or sorry, a bunch of circles, and then stack them on top of each other and make them mm. sort of smaller, that that I could create this illusion of a sphere, <laughs> um, and that's what I did. And and then after doing it, I thought boy, it'd be cool if I just colored these spheres in different colors to create sort of this eyeball effect. Mm. So it's just ranges of, it's just, uh, I think something like 500 circles and each yep. are colored slightly different to give this sort of, to make it look like an eyeball. Uh. I previously had uh, parameters that allowed you to click on them and rotate. Um, but then when parameter actions came out, I thought, well, I could sort of overlay a, a grid of points on it and then as I move my mouse over those points, the eyeball sort of follows it around. So, um, yeah, so that, that's the backstory of that. <laughs> Amazing. Kind of playing with weird ideas and weird things and then leveraging, you know, these new features like parameter actions to make it more, um, you know, interactive than, than clicking on parameters. Amazing. No, this is, I guess, a testament to how versatile <clears throat> Tableau is. I love it. If you yeah. have an idea, you can often follow it through. I've, I've definitely tested it a few times and it's great to see that that tool can do that. But also just, it's a great taste for anyone who's watching or listening of the kind of top quality content where you can learn and get inspired by going to Ken's uh, website and following him on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. So highly recommended. Um, <laughs> so no, cool, exciting project. It sounds like it's one of many, but it's I, I, I've definitely benefited from having better legends inside of Tableau. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay, cool. So um, before I we go into the rapid fire questions, uh, is there anything else you'd like to promote before we move on, or apart uh, from the uh, the Rhino charity? Um, you know, I, I we mentioned the Tableau Foundation. I just want to mention um, that you know they there are opportunities for people to um, to help um, with uh, with the foundation. So go check out their website. Um, there's something called the, um, oh boy, I, I forget what the name of it, but there's there's a, a volunteer sort of um, section um, where you can find ways to help these organizations or, or um, you know, different nonprofits. Um, so I definitely encourage people to go check that out and and use your skills to, you know, help some of these, some of these people. Um, to enhance their skills or to to bring more attention to to their cause. Excellent. No, that's cool. I'll, I'll put again links down. Everyone, get on board. No, thank you for yeah. that. Um, 
Okay, so we're getting into rapid fire questions because we only have right. about ten minutes left. Um, and just to and I've, just to make sure they are rapid fire, I'll try and keep as quiet as possible, and I'll let you <laughs> answer the questions. So, looking back at past past podcasts, I uh, feel like I chime in, but it's all about you. So, um, yeah. So for this section, we're going to just fire a couple of questions at um, Ken, see what sticks, uh, and right. get some good answers. So, first one is uh, I like to add this in pie charts. Love them or loathe them? Uh, neither. Um, you know, most of the time I think they do kind of a, a poor job for most use cases. Um, but I would never say that I loathe them. I think there are um, every every chart has, um, you know, some potential use case depending, you know, the audience, on the data, on, on the story you're trying to tell. So, and I think pie charts are the same um, example. Um, uh I, you know, there, I, I was in a, um, I'm going to turn this into a not rapid fire question, but there's a really example of this there. I was in an art museum, um, that was kind of focused on the, 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 uh, the show was kind of focused on data and, um, it was in Columbus. I was there with a, a group of other Tableau community people, including Kevin and, and Bridget, uh, uh, and Joshua Smith and, and a few other folks. Hmm. And we saw this, this piece of art um, that was a big pie chart and it had, um, I bet, 50 different slices on it. And all of our data viz, best practices, brains kind of explode and we were like, oh my God, that's the worst thing ever. <laughs> and then we stopped and we looked at it and we, we, we took a minute to understand what it was. And, and basically it was half of the pie was one color and then the other half was was a whole bunch of other slices, the other 49 slices. And as we, as we sought to understand what was going on, what it was showing was um, military spending uh, by countries in the U S or around the world. And what we realized was that 50% slice was the U S. And so we, all of us sort of turned around and said, Whoa, this is an amazing <laughs> use of a pie chart here because it really shows how one country's military spending dwarfs every other country in the world. It's as much as every other wow. country. Combined. Um, so, so I, th I think we just have to be very careful about bashing certain charts and saying, mm -hmm. you know, you never use these kinds of charts because there always are good use cases. And, it, and as I said, it all depends on, you know, your audience and the data and the, the story and the insight that you're trying to, to share with people. Yeah, totally. No, great answer. Right, there's a right tool for the right job, and sometimes exactly. pie chart can fit that. So that's that's awesome. Uh, next question is: Which publications do you follow regularly for data viz? Yeah, um, you know, so I'm always scooping up uh, data viz books and you know reading um, whatever I can find out there. Um, you know, I, I certainly pay attention to a lot of the. Hello, uh, community blogs. I read almost anyone that I see, um, but there are a few people that that you know I consistently look at every read every single blog that they post. Um, partially because I've learned so much from them over the years, um, and I just continue to learn so much from them. So people like Ryan Sleeper and Andy Creeble and uh, Jeffrey Schaefer, um, who I think you had on the the podcast, right? I did. Um, I think he was on last week's one. So right, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Um, so th when they post blogs, I always read them and, and and seek to really understand them and always learn something from them. Um, I've also, you know, been been following um, the Data Visualization Society pretty closely and have joined their Slack channel. And I, I try to read um, the blogs that they um, that they post. Um, actually was honored to have uh, written a blog for them just recently as well. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I follow that pretty closely. It's a really good way to kind of step outside of, of just the Tableau community and learn and see what other people mm -hmm. in the organization uh, community are doing. And can anyone follow that society? Is that like, yeah, I mean, it's for people that do this as a, as a profession, you know, right. or part of their profession. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, Anyone can join the Slack channel and um, they have a number of different um, uh, sub channels or whatever you call, call these things in Slack, you know, so if you're interested in historical data visualization, there's a channel for that. Um, if you're interested in, you know, uh, what 
if you want something that where people can give you a feedback, there's something for that. Um, so there's there's a little bit there for anybody who's interested in this topic. Cool. That's great. Okay, I'll have to go check that one out. Nice. Um, next question is, what is your number one Tableau trick for Tableau newbies? Right. So this might not be a trick. And, and I, if, if I remember, I think Jeff uh, may have given a similar answer. Um, but, you know, the, the thing I, I like for Tableau newbies to realize is that Tableau isn't just um, a place where you can create charts. It isn't, you know, like you put your data in, you click on a chart and boom, you have something. You can certainly do that. Um, but the platform is built in a way that it is sort of this, and, and I'll use a term that I know others have used before, uh, and, and I'm not sure exactly who, who coined it, but mm. it's a data-driven drawing tool. Um, and for me, when I first discovered that I could kind of just, if I, if I knew X and Y coordinates, that I could plot them on a scatter plot, and then I could connect them with lines, and then I could connect them to become polygons, that to me, when I learned that, opened up a whole new world of of what I could do with it because there's really no limit to it. it you know, if you if you can figure out those x and y coordinates, you can you can draw anything, and then if you can apply math to that to sort of automate the calculation of those points, you can draw curves and and you know all these crazy things like Sankeys and um, you know. So to me, you know, that's the biggest tip is kind of understanding that. Sure, you can plug in some data and choose a chart and really quickly and easily have this. But there's this whole other world of things you can do when once you understand how the platform works under the covers. Um, yeah. And I've written, uh, you know, I wrote a, a handful of blogs uh, called Beyond Show Me that really sort of focused on, on that. Um, and then last year at the conference, uh, Matt Chambers and I did a presentation on that where we kind of introduced this concept as well. So um, it's something that I think is, you know, yeah, it's definitely my number one thing for, for newbies to know. Cool. No, that's great. Yeah. Just not being limited or having an open mind about the tool, but also trusting from other experts that it can do the stuff, which it promises, or even it's not meant to do. Yeah. Right. Just try, try and break it like you've been doing. It's yeah. It's, it's, that's a good tip. Um, I like that. Uh, oh, so what is your favorite chart type? Yeah. You know, I, I I love all charts, so it's hard for me to pick. <laughs> um, fair enough. It, maybe my cop out answer is I my favorite chart is the one that best meets the goal I'm trying to accomplish, right? Hey, you know, yeah. Whatever that is certainly, you know, I'll, I'll use tons of bar bars and lines and maps and and mm. things like that. Um, but I also like, you know, unusual, uh, somewhat unusual charts. I love. Sankeys when, um, you know, when it's the right use case, mm. um, sunbursts are, are cool in the right use cases. Um, I, I, I enjoy creating weird charts, whether or not, you know, just to play with the idea and the concept and see where mm. they might. Work. Um, but yeah, I don't think I have any favorite chart. Um, just whatever makes the most sense for the data I'm working with. That's, that's my favorite chart. No, that's, that's a great answer. I think, um, yeah, having that, open-minded flexible approach um you don't want to just be known as the bar chart guy or the pie chart if it's not the right fit it's um what is it like if you give someone a if they only have a hammer everything starts looking like a nail right and it's just that's just not good for anyone so it's i, I like i like that approach that's a good answer i'm like i'm going to steal that with pride <laughs> <laughs> and um i'm just looking you know you just remind me very quickly i want to promote your sankey templates because that they're super hard to do from scratch. I often I find myself looking at them going, how the heck did someone do that? But um, but Jeff mentioned that you were going to do a post and you've just done it from the looks of it. You've got um, uh, templates where people can download the Tableau workbooks and actually see yeah. the, ma the math and the stuff behind it. So it's really generous of you. I, I love that you've, you're iterating or allowing others to yeah. iterate and build upon this. And all the hard work was done by, by Jeff and Olivier. Um, uh, Catherine, uh, I'm no, I'm not saying his name right, but mm -hmm. you know, they're the ones who kind of came up with the idea of of and, and sort of over time it developed, and they and I and I know Jeff went into this in some detail, but mm -hmm. you know, they deserve all the credit. I just took them and sort of <laughs> and made them really easy for you to plug your data in and, and create a, a, a sankey without thinking about all the math and, and the complicated stuff behind the scenes. 
Nice. No, that's brilliant. So, yeah, no, thanks for that. I'm definitely going to have to make it a mission to get into Sankey's more. We're, we're, again, when 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 appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, what other than Tableau, what other tools or software do you generally use uh, when making data visualizations? Yeah. Um, so I, I pretty much always use PowerPoint. Um, uh, just, just for, um, you know, whether it's you creating like a custom title with a different font and then, you know, because Tableau doesn't support a lot of different fonts on the web, um, you know, I'll build something in PowerPoint and then save it as an image and use that for my title. Um, but I also use it for creating custom icons and different types of graphics and things like that and for, for almost every visualization I do, I, I do something in PowerPoint and then I'll use um, you know, some free graphic editing tools to just kind of clean it up, take it the last step. Um, mm. Been using Tableau Prep a lot lately. Um, you know, to to clean up my data and prepare the data. Um, you know, I used it in the last IronViz competition, um, which had some some challenging data from a from a cleanliness standpoint. Mm. So I've been using that quite a bit to just create these automated workflows that I can just run and feed new data into and run. Um, at work, I use um, a number of other data, uh, another a number of other tools as, as well. I mean, we we do a lot of, of stuff with building out our data warehouse and data marts and, and things like that, and, and right. prep or visualizing or reporting that data. So I use a tool called Warescape, which is a, a data warehouse automation tool um, to to do a lot of that. So a, a lot of different tools, but yeah. um, you know, certainly uh, all very helpful and have their their place in the. In the and what we're doing yeah no definitely it's uh yeah rather than to be a you can't just be a one-trick pony there's i guess like with the charts you there's the right software for the job too so it's right. yeah, yeah. good you're applying that inside and outside of tableau this is good um I, ooh, so yeah how, one quick question what's your what was your first version of tableau so I had, I had to look back to see what that was i believe it was 9.3 um oh. 10.0 came out shortly after, like I was probably using Tableau for two or three months when 10.0 came out, came mm -hmm. out. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not like, I think I heard some people say like six and five yeah. and <laughs> it's, it's only been three or so years. So, uh, wow. I haven't used too many really old versions. <laughs> no, no, so you, you don't want to. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, equally inspiring. But you've, you know, you, the amount of work you're doing and the caliber of th in in three years is again super inspiring. So, I think a lot of people might see your work or others and go, "Oh, I've got to spend ten years learning all this stuff." But if you've done it in like three, that's anyway. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. Love it. Uh, okay, so you briefly touched upon it but what would be the one feature you'd like to see tableau implement which they haven't already yeah so i'm, I'm going to steal jeff's answer i think mm -hmm. jeff had the answer here i think we're going to steal that one again and and mm -hmm. just like to see greater uh, font support um you know whether it's web fonts or something like that to where we can you know so that i don't have to build these titles and powerpoint and bring them in as in images but more importantly you know they could just use different fonts within mm -hmm space areas um i think you know and, and tool tips and and all those things i think that would open up a lot of possibilities um so that's that's definitely something i would like to see but i also just kind of want to say that you know uh, i have so much respect for for the the tableau development team i mean oh, yeah. they they don't just kind of give us what we're asking for they give us some new feature that that allows us to do that thing and so much more and and I think set actions was a really good example, which came out in 2018.3. Hmm. I mean, there was nobody in the community, probably not one person who said, Give, I want set actions, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's nobody even really kind of understood what that could even mean, right? But yeah. then it came out, um, they had the foresight to create it and it came out and and then there was this explosion of innovation of different things that you can do, use this tool with. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I kind of, I almost to some degree sort of defer to the to the expertise of the dev team because they almost know what we need better than what we think we want, right? Yeah. Um, you know, instead of you know just giving us you know this functionality and this functionality and this functionality, they create this sort of 
big new feature that allows you to do that and so much more. And, and so um, I, I'll, I'll let them make the decisions and I'll just use them um, to the best of my ability once they come out. No, that's a great feature request um, or, and also a great um, point about the Tableau devs. Like they, they've got a lot of skilled people and sometimes they know what's best for us, even if we don't know. So uh, that's a very good point to take away, um, which makes looking me looking forward to each new release and especially devs on stage at the Tableau conferences. Um, yeah. But uh, you just, um, a previous comment you meant, uh, you made when you said you were resizing your Rhino Viz it made me think about another feature request, which I haven't seen yet. But like when you resize, resize a canvas, currently Tableau try, auto fits or rescales everything, which can be very frustrating when you're like, or maybe you're lined everything up. And I was just thinking, would you also like to see maybe a resize canvas, but not? image per se using photoshop terms like that kind of feature where if you add uh, 200 pixels below it just adds blank space not resizes everything yeah i i would love that uh, i mean i i use i don't use photoshop i use a free tool called paint.net and mm -hmm. you know i just want to add some space to the top or the left i can i can do that and i can choose you know does it add to all to the right or does it add to the left or does it mm -hmm. kind of just so I have all those kind of capabilities and it, you know, and I, I did mention this with the, with the Rhino viz that I kept resizing it. And then every time I did that, I had to go back and resize every loading element and it's really be really painful. So something like that, um, I'm sure there's an idea out there on the tablet forums uh, for this. Um, but it, you know, something like that would be really helpful and it would save us a lot of time. But I did discover recently um, I forget what I was creating, but I had a need. Um, I was I was right to the end, and I, and you know I had this huge. I think it was about ten thousand pixels high. Um, wow! I just add a little bit more to the bottom, and I just and I had dozens and dozens of floating elements, and oh, no. want to have to do that. So I went out and did some research, and I found on the forums that somebody had created a, a just a little VB script thing that you could um, you could pass in your your workbook you could tell it how big you wanted the canvas to be and it would just sort of out it basically edited the XML and outputted it and it worked perfectly and saved me um, uh, you know probably a couple of hours of, mm. of so I'll I'll dig that up and send it to you and you can yeah with in the podcast notes that's amazing yeah, i'd love to share that it's going to save me lots of hours too because it, it sometimes became quite prohibitive like i'd actually maybe second guess like do i actually want to add the extra thing expand it now because it's yeah. just gonna get to resize everything so yeah that, that's a game changer so yeah i'd love yeah if you can find it i'll definitely pop it in the links below and yeah, I'll use I'll it myself it thank you um Okay, so um, we've actually reached the end of the podcast. So um, just like to thank um, Ken for his time. Um, it's been really great having you on the show, and I've learned a lot personally, and I hope the listeners and viewers have too. Um, before we head off, is there anything else you'd like to maybe mention or or say? Uh, no, I think I think we've covered it. But thank you for having me, David. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, so that's it for today's episode and thanks for listening be sure to check out the show notes for everything we've covered today and if you're new to the podcast consider subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes also visit datasaurus-rex.com forward slash welcome to see all the other data visualization content we have to help you out until the next time thank you very much <laughs>